Morning guys, how are we doing today? Uh, today, I'm gonna answer a question that I've been asked quite a lot. And it was kinda, comes in a couple different phrasings, but where did my love affair with jazz come from? When did it start? Uh, where does my passion stem from? Uh, and it's kind of a multifaceted question. And a lot of these answers are going to be things I reference at times in my episodes. But I want to try to stitch them all together into one hopefully interesting diatribe. Uh, I come very much from a rock and roll, heavy metal even, background. In high school, it would have been Motley Crue and Judas Priest, Straight Preacher's Kid, uh, Pantera became like that next level for me as a, as a 20 year old. Cats always messing the fuck about. Uh, then, of course, you get into the classic rock. Stones, The Beatles, Pink Floyd, Zeppelin. That was a big phase for me. Neil Young, all the great classic rock guys. Hendrix, Traffic. I was really into that stuff. And that kind of coincided with the mid early 90s when everybody was dumping their vinyl for nothing off at record stores, pawn shops. And pawn shops still carry vinyl, especially some of the independent ones, into the late 90s before they usually sold their stock off to record stores. But uh, I was a few pawn shops. I was finding old dead records, and I was like, wake of the flow, what is this, you know? Uh, it was fun to get to this one anonymous pawn, just walls of anonymous records, because none of them were sorted. And I remember going through there, I, as I'd walk from my bus stop off Interstate 35W, on Lake Street, walking west towards Lindale to stay on Aldrich Avenue on 26th. And this anonymous pond was on my way. So it would be cold fall, cold winter evenings. You know, it gets dark up here by five o'clock. So I'd come in there at 6.30 when I got off the bus, six o'clock, and I would just come out at 8, 8.30, two hours later, covered in dust. But you'd end up stumbling across seven numbered white albums, you know? And I think I ended up buying three different white albums there over the top course of time. And I think I gave one of them away at one point, but I think I still have two of them. Uh, but I just found some really cool stuff. And so my love affair with vinyl starts growing because CDs were so expensive. CDs got stolen. Vinyl had no one giving a shit about it. And so I started buying this stuff dirt cheap. And this guy didn't even price his stuff. He just looked at the pile and be like, oh, give me 20 bucks. Okay, sure. You know, and being a musician, being kind of, it was the fuel for my engine, even then music. I would buy records and collect overeating at times. If it meant I only had three bucks left to get a couple 99 cent burgers at Wendy's or something, I was okay with that. And part of my knowledge is my OCD compulsion. I'm very much... Once I get into an artist, I want to collect all their stuff. I'm almost compulsed to do it. And in that process of collecting all their stuff, you learn a lot. <clears throat> and that kind of continues to this day. A lot of my knowledge comes from my OCD. I want to dig into something, and as I get fascinated with it, I feel like I need to become more knowledgeable about it so I can speak on it. But then the more I want to speak on it, the more I want to be sure I know what I'm talking about. And like, for example, if I post something about a record, and you say to me, oh, my favorite record by them, or their best record, I mean, is this. Are you saying that's the best record by them because you've heard or own all their stuff? Or are you saying because of the two or three that you've heard, that's your favorite? And I think we have to really carefully choose our words. And I don't want to ever say something is an artist's best effort unless I have that artist's body of work. So I wanted to quantify my opinions with a volume of information. And so that kind of dovetails into why I can say and cross-reference some of the things I can because of my OCD, because of my compulsive nature, my organizing structural nature to things. I like to know chronology, timelines, and dates. And so a lot of that all kind of puts records within a framework chronologically, uh, label-wise. I have a strong social leaning. 
and comprehension and so I always applied that texture as well but even as a 20 something collecting Floyd and the Dead and the Beatles I was hearing the message of the summer of love the hippie message was becoming something I was grasping and being born in Canada living up there class 17 the counterculture wasn't something we really talked about much up in Canada you know the summer of love the 60s that was very much an American phenomenon in a lot of ways uh, of course Vietnam was an American phenomenon as well but uh, there, was a, there was kind of a glorification of the 60s in film with films like Flashback with Dennis Hopper and uh, The Doors movie that kind of stuff was coming on and so I got into that stuff and I started hearing the consciousness of that music at times you know some of the things that uh, Crosby Stills and Nash you know wooden ships I was like oh that's it's kind of moving the integrity of Neil Young uh, Frank Zappa's mockery of the plastic people you know, I mean, it all kind of connected with me. And being a music lover and a musician, as my collection started growing, I started adding soul and funk and different elements. And then eventually jazz came across my table. And my initial reaction to jazz was I didn't get it. Uh, and this was early on. And I got Bitches Brew back then a lot better than I feel about it now. In a silent way to me, I got on the corner, I was kind of getting that. I definitely got the Hancock stuff, you know, and that was kind of bringing me in. Uh, artists and hip hop were sampling jazz. So I knew it had a validity and a connection, but I wasn't quite grasping any of it at that point. But as I started digging in, I started to appreciate the virtuosity of the music. That was the thing I kind of think I really connected with first is, man, a lot of these guys are great players. And one of the things Pantera kind of taught me was sometimes space allows a groove to be thicker. And if you listen to a lot of those great Pantera riffs, Five Minutes Alone, Unbroken, Walk, there's a ton of space between when Dimebag's riffing and the next riff. It's spaced. And so it allows the drums to really find a pocket and have a groove. Chili Peppers, Blood Sugar Sex Magic had that element as well. Rick Rubin kind of brought that home. And it was the black element of the funk. And so I was kind of learning this whole dynamic. And about this time I started DJing. I collected quite a bit of soul, you know, uh, classic rock like Santana that kind of crosses over. And I was playing old funk disco soul records with the hip hop that I already knew. And just kind of playing stuff I thought would be fun for people and a lot of times people would rather hear songs they know that are fun than some DJ who's great mixing up a bunch of house tracks that nobody knows and I'm actually a fan of house music but I took a lot of their jobs not intentionally but just by looking at the crowd and going they probably want to hear some of this oh this would probably feel good right now this would be fun here's some Wilson Pickett Mustang Sally how's that feel and so I very much got into reading a room and feeling what the audience had to say, and that kind of was informing me. And then as my audience started to grow, it started becoming very black. And so I started learning a lot about the black community, and that started informing my musical taste. And DJing for black folks, uh, they won't dance to something that ain't funky. They won't dance to something that's not good. They will actually look at you with stink face and be like, what's that? Oh, that's Miles Davis Bitches Brew. Uh, turn it off is what you do. Uh, okay. I didn't know. You know? And it was an eye opener that they didn't look at the name of the artist and, and value if they liked it by that factor. They valued it by the factor of, okay. I, I, they almost couldn't help move to what was good you know and god forbid they know it because then they're really gonna be like and you make a room full of sisters start to make some noise you're gonna inflame the whole room with energy so i started feeding them and giving them more of what they wanted to hear and it just kind of started growing my, and propelling my black audience but it was impacting how i perceived and heard music and how maybe what i like isn't necessarily always going to be good and good if we need to define it is how does a room of people respond to it so 
So it kind of restructured my definitions. And not everyone has to agree with my definitions, but good, for the large part, how people respond to it is a fairly good indicator. And it's great to dig into stuff that's deeper than what the masses like. And the masses obviously don't always have the best taste, but most, most music that's made for them to process is made to be from an R&B black spatial groove, the pop music of today, it's all meant to be that, listenable. And as I started working my way back, I was surprised to see how jazz and blues were at the root of so much of it. And that Ray Charles was directly linked back to the Ellingtons and the Armstrongs and the Callum Basies and, and Louis Jordans. Like it was so interwoven, black music became this interconnected generational progression of dance within that community and celebration and joy. And so this is all impacting my viewpoint of music and the social aspect, the dynamic of it. I started learning the difference between stuff that charted on the R&B charts and was a big hit versus stuff that crossed over into the pop charts and was a big hit. And the big difference there is white folks only know the one that crossed over into the pop charts. So when you're the Commodores and you make Brick House and that becomes a big pop and R&B hit, white folks will know that. When you're Rick James and you do Super Freak and it's a big R&B hit but it's also a big pop hit, white folks are going to know that one. But they ain't going to know any of the other Commodore songs because most of the other Commodore songs were only R&B hits. And so you start learning all those dynamics and see how divided even our music listening is and how stuff's so almost intended that you go over here and you listen to that music and I'm going to go over here and listen to my music and then you go over there and listen to your angry music. It's, it, it's, it's crazy how much a lack of a greater unity, a greater oneness exists in most people's mentalities. But anyway, so I'm, yeah, I'm getting into the music. I'm starting to dabble in jazz. And one of the things that first really drew me in was a, the musicality. I'm like, these guys can play. You know, the, B, the recognition of its connection to what came after it. And then number three was like, I really loved the cover art of 50s, especially record album, jazz record album covers. They're great. And a lot of them have those little sequential numbers on them, like Blue Note, like Prestige. And boy, if that doesn't draw someone with OCD in. So you start digging in. And the next real big moment for me was when I realized when I listened to jazz and this was unlike any other music I listened to and I liked stuff like Brian Eno's ambient stuff because my mind could kind of drift and you don't really get sucked into the same experience in your mind every time you hear instrumental music. When you listen to songs with vocals, those vocals will often really shape and dictate the things your mind is thinking when you're listening to it. And it kind of keeps you almost in a box. And that goes for all the greats. The Beatles, Led Zeppelin, you know, the Grateful Dead. I'm in the woods playing with turtles listening to the dead most of the time so disconnected from reality. When I'm listening to uh, Led Zeppelin, there's always a wizard off in the woods. You know, those words have me very much in the shape of the Misty Mountain Hop and the Great Ocean Treks. And this uh, Iron Maiden has you flying with Icarus and fighting as, as, an, as a jet fighter plane. And you don't really get to escape the lyrics listening to that music. So your mind isn't really free to wander. But jazz for me became that next big experience when I realized that when I put on jazz, a record of jazz, that 20 minutes will fly by like five minutes and I'll often miss half the record because my mind was wandering. And because of the content of what I was hearing, black men from the 50s and 60s most often, I was contextualizing the black experience today that I'm experiencing firsthand with, with my following 
and recognizing how much more difficult things were back then. And I'm just kind of processing that this music has power to it. And it wasn't like I grasped it like I see it now, but inevitably because of what the experience was, my mind would come to a place in where it was roaming, where I would think about social constructs. And so I would inevitably find myself sitting there having a subliminal conversation with myself, perhaps with my consciousness, about race, economics, music, and art. Dabbling in the history and putting on the geography and all my different schools of understanding. I'm a big fan of urbanity and skyscrapers. And so I'm putting all these pieces together. And it's, it was just amazing to me how free my mind was to not just imagine, to not just dream, but to almost philosophize. I, thought, I found myself coming up with these epiphanies and these, oh, aha moments, just being lost in the side of a jazz record. And I'd end up being like, man, I was so deep in thought there that I missed that whole side. I need to play that side again. And next thing you know, your mind's back being triggered and you're feeling back in that same thought process. And I'd be just, sometimes I'd listen to a record four times, one side, just trying to hear it. But my mind would always end up on these long journeys. And along the way in those journeys, little pieces of light, little puzzle pieces were putting themselves together for my various schools of thought. And it became this informational aha. And I liked, in a way, in my recreational time when I was putting on music, even though I have rock and so many different things, blues, uh, reggae, I got some classic country, I got just infinite stuff. Funk, soul, hip hop, thousands of them for days. But in my own free time, I found myself, I don't really want to sit there and listen to Parliament Flashlight and think about parties and sex right now. You know, I just, my wife and me just, you know, did our thing. Sex ain't really on my mind. And often words in R&B and sex, it's kind of really all it's about. And I don't want to really even hear or think of or feel about what somebody else's words are telling me. Because on some level, I recognize how bullshit words are. And that kind of became the next real tear for me is that when I listen to jazz, I could feel an honesty from them. And I'm sure I've talked about this before, but words are so dishonest. And when a jazz player is just speaking and emoting into their horn, it's impossible for your soul to bullshit me. It can't comment on things that hasn't seen or done. It's not wanting to be full of bravado and ego and compensate for the things it doesn't know. A man's soul speaking into its horn, there's an honesty to that that was just like, oh, that's incredible. I need that. I need to feel I'm not being lied to. Because I feel like I'm being lied to all the fucking time. Every time I turn on the TV, I'm like, oh, that's bullshit. Oh. I see what the, I see how they're reshaping that story to make people think a certain way. It's exhausting having to kind of always adjudicate and try to make sense of all the information you hear. And I would shut that out and just put on jazz at night and find my mind just drifting through human history. And it kind of became that moment at one point where I'm like, Wow, people who are oppressed for generations are the ones who can quantify what freedom is. It's only a man in chains that knows what freedom looks like. And the winners of the great wars write the history books, the losers of those wars make great art. And that principle, that parable of the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, while being living in occupied and depression that freed them and liberated them, allowed them to celebrate and rejoice in spite of 
the stark reality they lived in. And here in America, there was that same dichotomy where a lot of this music is so full of celebration, life, and joy, in spite of the oppression they lived in. And it just speaks of the human spirit to want to overcome. And uh, if you can celebrate and dance in spite of your oppressor's chains, you find a freedom. And that's empowering to us, the listener. There's a message in that. And the biblical nature of jazz, that parallel of you've held us down for so long that we've written such great pieces of art about what freedom is and, and how our dreams of freedom will look someday that they will forever stand the test of time. And in the long scope of history, what the winners write does get me measured against what the losers wrote in art. And we know as much about Rome and ancient Egypt and Persia and Alexander the Great from those who he conquered and those they occupied. We learn as much from their texts, their inscriptions, their experience with this occupying army, their life full of terror and tyranny, or the fairly righteous and uh, fair rule of the Egyptians in this moment in time, the Romans in this, in this moment in time. And so there's a historical value to the art of what the losers are saying, that history will measure. And the future someday will look at this music of these black musicians and they will recognize as I'm high that the message of Chuck D and, and, and Harris one was the same as the message of Marvin Gaye on what's going on. And that's the same as the message of the hard bop. And so all that electrified me. And it seemed like, wow, this music has a lot more importance than just about the notes and the virtuosity. And that felt like it was such a noble thing. And it so impacted how I started to listen to jazz. Because that's the moment where it went from, I don't want to just hear this music. I want to feel this music. And so suddenly now you're at this doorway where your mind is free to wander because there's not words telling it where to go. And you're also recognizing that there's this freedom of celebration and this joy of expression and this documentation of injustice and it's going to inform my mind and now I'm also feeling when I hear it, not just listening and now all of a sudden there's a time where a guy can get guttural on his horn or just the slowest, most painful blues and the words left out. It no longer was without words. Suddenly there was a very clear emoting. And the power of emoting via improvisation, it's the magic of this art. Because all other musics can emote and express a condition. However, even vocalist music like Brian Eno's music for airports, it lets my mind wander, but it tells me the same story every time I hear it. It doesn't really variegate. And jazz, because of the improvisation aspect of it, it tells a different story every time that it plays the record and every time you listen to it you might hear a different inflection a different guttural utterance a different soul speaking screaming yelling peacefully calmly speaking into its horn about its place in this world and the existence that it's forced to abide in now this music is becoming powerful and magical and all these contexts started making my listening at home my love for this music grow exponentially and then there was that last aha moment 
of when I heard Lee Morgan on Locomotion, Blue Train. You've heard me talk about it probably in four or five episodes. And Coltrane does his Locomotion break. Curtis Fuller plays his Locomotion break. And then the band kind of pauses and the great Lee Morgan comes in and Lee Morgan spits this fire that throat grabbed me. It's like, get out, listen to this. And the initial kind of thought that came to my mind that day is, shit, it must have rained on him on the way to work today. Someone must have splashed him with a puddle when the bus went by. That was my thought. But that was kind of like, oh shit. That's exactly what the jazz player gets to do. Unlike a guy who's singing a song who has to kind of follow the words, even when I'm not feeling how much I love this bitch today, I sing that same shit. A jazz player could be like, I'm having a shitty day today, motherfucker, god damn it. I stubbed my fucking toe, my wife's a fucking bitch. I ran out of whiskey way too early last night. All that shit's just coming out. And if we have this great deal of empathy and understanding this context, this jazz can be an incredibly expressive, mind-grabbing, soul-lurching... Wow. And every once in a while you can sit there and listen and just feel something from a player that hit a note that was just like, oh, fuck yeah. This is, they just got it out all of a sudden. And it takes sometimes a dozen listens to a record, and all of a sudden that one day your perception, your receptiveness is right in that right place where Hodges crawls in that ear of yours and goes, ah, motherfucker, this is what I gotta say. And you gotta say, hallelujah. Can I get an amen? It's a gospel. It's as important as Moses and the Ten Commandments and all the Lord is my shepherd. It's the same thing. You oppress me, and I'm gonna show you how victorious and resilient I am, motherfucker. Believe that. I'm standing on my own two feet. I can dance with chains on my ankles. You better believe it. You, you wanna make a tight Go ahead. I'll dance with my waist. Come on now. You wanna put my weight? Okay, I'm up here. I'm up here. You can't stop me. That resistance to tyranny that's non-violent and expresses through art is so powerful. But it requires the listener to grasp the history. And so that Morgan moment, it was like everything I'd heard in jazz before that moment, I hadn't heard anything. Okay, I didn't know nothing. I hadn't heard a thing. So I hadn't really felt anything before from that dynamic. And it was like I had to go read back and hear everything over again. And boy, you want to put some evangel in a young man hearing that new epiphany. And it was about that time I started doing my, my Facebook groups, started sharing that stuff. And I'd kind of get in debates with some people. Some people don't want to hear it. Some people don't want to hear about race when they're talking about their high five speaker system. Why are you talking about race again? I'm like, you ain't talking about the story. Let's quit talking about the cover. Quit talking about the ink this book is written in. Let's talk about this narrative. What this means. Because it's power. There's a power there that can make me get through my bad days. And throughout this whole fucking corona shit, jazz is like, okay, yeah, I can't even begin to feel bad for myself yet. You know what I mean? Wait until some shit really goes bad. You know what I mean? I, I know they're trying to fear me, and the fear gets in a little bit at times, but I can put on some jazz for a minute and be like, these motherfuckers live this shit every day for centuries. Okay? I still got food on my table. We'll get through today. We'll talk about tomorrow tomorrow. So that's a power. That's what religion does. That's why there's a magic. That's why people go to church, to help get them through the day. Jazz has it. That makes us the greatest art form that this country and the last few centuries has come across. And so that last step was the three brush strokes. 
okay, a guy's gonna speak from his soul and tell me something, and I wanna feel it. But how can I feel a guy I don't know? How can I tell what his horn is saying? And there's always gonna be an element of guesswork and a certain amount of intuition based off of some factors. And those factors are one, what was the environment so-and-so was born into? And you best believe what Armstrong was born into, what Billie Holiday was born into, it's gonna be a whole lot different than what Pat Metheny or, or John Schofield was born into. So man, they're coming from different places. So that changed my focus really. I'm like, okay, really jazz from beyond 1970 has to have a whole different engine fueling it. And I was pretty sure of that. And then you take, you take that environment, now you layer in a musician's experience within that environment. What does that mean? Well, it means things like, this is a fun Donna record, this is a collection of tenor stuff from the label, Getz, Sims, Wardell Gray, Paul Kinnache, some great stuff on there actually, tough record to find. But their environment and their experience are going to inform a lot of what they have to tell us. And their experience with that environment is things like your parents. Was your father abusive? Was he dead? Was he gone? Was he a great dad? That's going to inform. Was your mom loving? Was she pushing you away? That psychology tells us parents are going to shape a lot of our emotion, a lot of our personality, you know? And so was there a drug problem? Was there an alcohol problem? Were, were they a pimp? Were they bad with women? Were they abusive to women? Did they not have any luck with women? Were they a ladies man? These are all factors that color. So you have the environment, you have their experience within the environment, and things like being abused by the police, spending time in jail, mental facilities, Mr. Bud Powell. The things that happened to these guys colored their expression and their emoting. And so environment and personality are two great dictations. But that last and most important piece in some ways is our personality. And that's how we handle our experience within our environment. And it's what allows a guy like Hank Mobley to be a gentle emoter who's soothing and calming because his way of processing is to kind of gently work his way through things versus the fire of a guy like Clifford Brown who thinks maybe if I make enough light, I can lose some of this darkness. Armstrong, he blew darkness away. Only to have it come closing back in when that horn stopped to play. And so the magic, important symbolance of this music and its historical context and where it takes my mind when I listen to it my freedom to imagine, to dream, to kind of, to live within a philosophy and to, to further my philosophy, the epiphanies. It all became a love affair that made it hard for me to put other things on. Because oftentimes within 20, 15, 20 minutes, I'm like, oh, I'm kind of bored with this. You know, I like your Stones. Beggar's Bank was a great record. But you're still kind of keeping me within the context of British American experience in the late 60s, the hippie mod movie. Like there's, it just gives you a certain vibe and a feel that kind of doesn't really change. But when I put on jazz records, my mind would just go everywhere. And it felt so broad, so earthling, so human, and encapsulating. And it spoke to me and it still speaks to me with such a bright light. And so my love affair, my passion, it all stems from me recognizing how important this music is. It's not just some guy saying, look how great I am as a player, my ego needs you to tell me I'm amazing. It's not that. It's not just a pretty album cover with a nice heavy grain, deep groove vinyl. It's not that. It's the magic 
of the resilience of the human, no matter what his condition, to say, I shall overcome. I shall not be held in chains in spite of these chains. And how freeing that was for me as a person not in bondage to let go of a lot of my unhappiness, resentment, uh, unfulfilled financial expectation, all those things that I thought were so the measure, happiness is the only measure. And when you can find happiness, you find success. When you find joy, when you find celebration, when you find community, belonging, when you find love, when you have hope, when you have trust, and there's one thing the black community had, is they had the solidarity. Because we were fighting against such a common oppressor that our petty differences have to be set aside in the furtherance of the black community. And not to say there's not rifts and problems, but there's a lot more unity in the ensemble of the black community than there is in the white community by any stretch. And even when it comes to music, old black folks still hear young white black kids music and young black kids know grandpa's music and they they can get down to james brown when they're six years old i feel good but like it's a in occupation in times of stress it kind of forces you to pull together and so my love affair my passion it all kind of stems from this slow gradual series of epiphanies magic moments of understanding where your hair stands on end you're like oh oh man I just got a little charge of energy from that woo what that just told me was this and you keep building on that and so here now I am on my YouTube channel I got the Patreon thing going if you haven't had the chance to check it out you should if you can donate even five bucks a month I'd appreciate it I want to keep doing this this is my calling I, I, I feel this in my bones I can do this every day you know, I don't want to go back to 9 to 5 and, and do an episode once a week or something. I need to speak my soul. I just feel it coming out of me every day, you know. And there's going to be some extra great content coming on the Patreon channel. I'm working on a great jazz journal magazine that's going to have about 25 videos embedded into it. As you flip the pages, there'll be videos on every page. And they're going to be reviewing lots of cool subjects. I got a number of cool guest writers giving me... Uh, little video shorts to put in there. Uh, the Jazz Journal is going to be worth whatever you donate to me every month. You know, five, ten bucks is what most are doing. And if I get 500 people giving me five bucks a month, um, I'll be great. So uh, I don't want to talk about money on every episode, but I do have to make a living. My wife insists. And uh, my unemployment's going to run out in three, four weeks. So I do need to have a little urgency right now and say, you appreciate the content help us out any way you can uh, y'all be safe up there I got some great stuff coming in the works uh, we'll talk to y'all soon peace